Uh, I don't necessarily have a Father's Day message for us today. I felt like God has some other message for me to, to deliver today. But I do want to start off today just by giving some admonitions to our dads. Because listen, I think there's very few places where a fatherhood is elevated and celebrated in our, in our culture today, and yet it needs to be. And first of all, I want to say all dads, you're a hero, whether you realize it or not. You are a hero, and it's a God-given role that God has placed you in. I mean, I mean, he really is the one that puts you in the role of being a father, and uh, so it, you didn't decide to just wake up and be a dad one day. He put you in that role. He gave you that privilege, that honor, and, uh, and so no one else can take your place. And listen, I know as we, as dads, none of us are perfect, and that isn't the goal. Perfection isn't the goal. I mean, if, if we could be perfect, we would, but let's face it, none of us are, and it doesn't matter if you're a, a man or a woman you're not perfect but by by any means we are there to make an impact in our kids lives and I think for very first and foremost that is in the area of passing on our faith to our kids I mean they're watching our walk with God and there is nothing I don't think lately that I've been taking more serious than that is realizing like my kids are watching my walk on a daily basis and I am trying to model faith in God. Uh, they're, they're really looking at our love for them and how we love them and how we love other people. They're, those things are, are being passed on. Those things are more uh, caught, not taught, right? And so your kids are, are seeing that. Uh, they see your strength. They see your discipline. They may not like your discipline always, but they see it and they know it. And someday they're going to appreciate that and in their lives and they see your wisdom that that we live out every single day now listen uh, they also learn from our mistakes and I think that's really an important one because I mean I I don't know about you but I strive not to make mistakes but I still make them right <laughs> and listen I had a great father and I was really blessed to have a really great father and he wasn't perfect though and I realize as being a dad now for six years now um, that listen I have missed the mark so often of what it means to be really a good dad. And I realize though, again, that is not the goal. I'll never be perfect. But here's what I've learned is, is something very important for us to really uh, take hold of. And that is this, we're called to pass on a legacy of fatherhood to our kids. And it's something that isn't talked about much today. It isn't something that is elevated as being something important. But listen, here's my goal is, uh, my goal was to look at my dad and the father that he was and to exceed what he was as a dad. Even though he's a great dad, I wanted to take it to the next level. My goal and really how I feel like I'm going to measure my success is if I can see Levi be a better dad than I was. And if I can pass on a legacy of improving and being a father from generation to generation to generation, then... All families, our family is going to be different and society is going to be different. But very few places you're going to go into and hear about the legacy of passing on being a father. So it's not about being perfect. It's actually about kind of taking what you've been given and moving it up a bar and then passing it on to the next generation and letting them move it up the bar and, and seeing, seeing just this transformation take place. And so I think like that is one of the things that we need to see today. So dads, I want you to know again, you're a superhero to your kids. They're they, they look at you. I, I've seen this even in the worst dads, like their kids still look up to them. You're their hero and they're wanting to see you and, and the impact you're making in their lives. And they will always be your kids. So don't miss how important this role is that God has given you. It's a very special role and, uh, and it's God given. And it is, it is something that I think most of us take seriously. But I, I just want to encourage you today to keep at it, keep strong keep striving to be the best dad you can be and, and with God's help. I mean, because there's nothing that <laughs> will drive you to your knees in prayer more than being a dad, I think, uh, because you realize your shortcomings. Listen, it's good to be back from vacation. I'm probably like many of you who get back from vacation and you're like, I want to go back. <laughs> like, I'm not done yet, but uh, you know, we jumped in with both feet. I do feel refreshed. I do feel energized. I'm excited about what God is doing, what God's going to do in our church. Again, uh, I'm excited about what Pastor Epperson said about 
filling services twice in here, and I think uh, that, that's what I want to see us do and, and fill these seats. We have plenty of room. It's great to see, though, all the chairs back down and, and just having that opportunity again. Um, but today, I want to focus on a message about wrestling with God. Now listen, the reason why uh, the reason why, why this message kind of came about was I was just praying about what to do on Father's Day. And uh, all of a sudden, I was just in my devotions, came across this passage in Scripture and started reading it. And it just caught my attention. Then later on in the week, I'm reading a book. And, and there's part of the story of this in this book that I'm reading. A few days later, I open up this prayer book that I use sometimes to help me pray. And the verse it uses is from this passage. And I learned something a long time ago. When God brings something your way one, two, or three times, he's trying to get your attention. <laughs> and if you ever see that happening in your own life, where God just keeps bringing something to your mind, no. Like God has something in there for you. And, and for this, it was not just for me, it was for our church. And I knew it was. And, uh, and so that's why we're talking about this passage about wrestling with God. Listen, when I was a kid, uh, I watched WrestleMania on Saturday morning. So I don't know if any of you remember that. Like that's going way back in the day when, you know, you, you didn't have DVRs or anything like that. You just, it was on Saturday mornings. And listen, my parents wouldn't let us watch it, so we were always going to our friend's house and watching it there. <laughs> and it wasn't supposed to be, but we were learning. Me and my brother were learning all the moves and all the famous... Uh, I mean, back in that day, they had something called the claw. I don't know, anybody remember that one? Uh, some of you aren't old enough. Uh, we had the power driver. I think they still use that one. Um, but listen, we stopped at chairs. We didn't hit each other with chairs. <laughs> uh, but listen, when my parents left the house and we would be home, me and my brother would turn our living room into a wrestling ring and we had a staircase that came down we, we used the third step as a top rope and we would jump on each other and we would just go at it now maybe maybe you don't do the physical wrestling thing you've never done it in your life but listen every one of us we wrestle with things in our lives all the time I mean if you have ever made a decision and you've had multiple things to do, you've wrestled over that, right? And if you didn't, you've made the wrong decision. And if you wrestled over it, you still might have made the wrong decision, but there's a wrestling match that goes into our lives when we're making decisions. We wrestle over doubts. I mean, oftentimes it's just, we don't know and we, we just have these doubts that come in our lives and we wrestle with those. We wrestle with worry all the time. I know in our culture today, we're filled with things that we worry about and we're constantly wrestling with those. Now, we also, also, also wrestle with other things like people. <laughs> like you wrestle with people when, when they don't... Uh, when you're trying to get your way, right? <laughs> you're trying to wrestle them onto your page. We wrestle with people to win an argument. Sometimes we're wrestling people relationally because we're trying to get their attention or get them to love us. And we have these wrestling matches with people. We even wrestle with God through something called prayer. Anybody do that? Like I was, you're trying to what? wrestle God into answering your prayer the way you want it. That's why we wrestle, right? Because he's not answering it the way we want it. And we're trying to to, to put him in an arm lock so that he finally will say yes. Or we wrestle with God often when we struggle with things like sickness. And there's a wrestling match that happens. Or we wrestle with God when we lose a job or something like that. Or we wrestle with God when something tragic happens in our lives. Some of us, if we're honest, we wrestle with God in even believing if he exists. And some of that is rooted in this, that we feel like, where is God? We don't feel his presence. If he's everywhere and he's all around us, why don't I feel him? Why don't I sense him here? And this is really why I think this story that we're going to look at today about wrestling with God is so important because it shows us that wrestling with God can actually lead to a changed life. And that's what we really need. That's what we want. So the story we're going to look at today is found in Genesis 32. It's part of the story of Jacob's life. And uh, I just want to do an overview of Jacob's life before we really get into the meat of today's message because I don't want to assume that everyone knows his life story. And even if you do, it really sets up what's really going on when we get to the main part of the story. So let me first of all start off with this. Jacob is a twin. And he's the second born of the twin. And the Bible says that he is literally grabbing the heel of his brother on the way out. 
<laughs> of being born. Like he's like, hey, get back in here. I want to be first. <laughs> and the mother names him Jacob because Jacob means grabber. And basically this is what he lived his life doing, trying to grab life, take what's not even his. And he constantly lived his life trying to grab onto life. Now listen, his brother is Esau, and these two boys couldn't be any more different from one another. I mean, they're complete like opposites. And so Genesis 25, 27 tells us that the boys grew up and Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the open country, while Jacob was content to stay at home among the tents. And what we find out is Esau is his dad's favorite, okay? Because, I mean, his dad just loves the fact that he's out, he's out using his hands, he's hunting, you know, he's a fighter. And Jacob is anything but that. I mean, Jacob's a mama's boy. <laughs> Jacob, he doesn't want to go very far from home. And really, let's just be honest, guys, we're probably in one of those two camps. We're either the daddy's boy and we're a fighter and we're, all, or we're a mama's boy and we're just kind of don't want to be far from home. But that's what these two boys are. And so here's the deal. One day Esau is out hunting, but he's not having a successful day. But he comes back in from the hunt and he's just famished. He's, he's starving. And his brother has been home all day cooking soup. <laughs> Okay, and, and he walks in and he says, hey, give me some of that soup. And his brother sees an opportunity. And so Jacob says, listen, I'll tell you what, I'll give you some soup if you give me your birthright. And he said, well, my birthright's not any good to me if I'm dead. And so he made the trade, which was a horrible trade. In fact, the Bible actually says that... Um, it says that, that God basically looked at that trade and, and he says he despised his birthright. He uses the word despise. He didn't see just how valuable this was because this was God-given, remember. Like your, first, your birthright, you didn't get a pick that you were first. God picked you to be first. And you throwing that away and giving that away shows that you despise what God has given you. And so Jacob has the birthright. But as his father gets older, he wants to bless his oldest son Esau with a special blessing. And so he says, hey, listen, go out and, and, and I don't know how long I have, so go out and, and hunt and come back and I want to give you a blessing. So he goes out and he hunts, but his, his uh, wife, Rebecca, hears about it and she, he, she concocts a plan to get Jacob to steal this blessing and it works. And when Esau comes back and finds out that his brother stole his blessing that was coming from his father. The Bible says he's livid, he's furious, he's burning with so much anger that he's plotting to kill him as soon as his father dies. That's how mad he is. Now listen, when each of us are, face fear, the, the common way of facing fear is called fight or flight, right? <laughs> I mean, either you stand there and you fight or you book it out of there. And what we see, and every one of us has that, okay? And, and let me just tell you, the common way is to flee, okay? That's more people flee than stand and fight. And, and so it's more common for that. But listen, Esau was a fighter. Jacob was a fleer. He got out of there. He looked for opportunities. And so R Rachel realizes Esau's fuming. She sends his son away out of the country to Haran, to her brother Laban. And he gets to, his brother, uh, to her brother Laban and he takes care of him and takes him into his house. And he sees that Laban has a daughter and, and Rachel is beautiful. <laughs> and he likes her right off the bat and he falls in love with her. And he, Laban says, listen, if you work for me for seven years, you can have my daughter. And so the Bible says for Jacob, it was like, it was like only a few days because he was so much in love with her. That's how head, and head over heels he is with her. But something that always perplexes me about the story is they have the wedding, they have the night where he's going to consummate the marriage, and he wakes up and it's not Rachel. <laughs> it's Leah, the oldest daughter. Laban did a switcheroo on him and he didn't even know till the next morning. And I just don't know how that happens, but it happened. And he wakes up and he's now getting a taste of his own medicine of how he's a deceiver. And so he, Laban says, listen, it wasn't customary for the oldest to not be married first. So you can have 
you can have Rachel as well, just work for me seven more years, which he does. And then he works a few more years for Laban to uh, acquire some flocks and to build up his flocks. And it says that Laban had changed his wages 10 different times. Like he's constantly undercutting Jacob and what he's doing. And Jacob wakes up one day and realizes, you know what, this isn't fair, I need to get out of here. And so he, in the middle of the night, lives up to his name and lives up to his personality, he, he takes off, he flees. Instead of confronting him, he takes off, he runs away from the fight. And so Laban chases him down and their solution is to basically draw a boundary and say, listen, I'm not gonna come over this line to, to you guys and you don't come back over this line. And so there's these lines drawn between them. And so this is where we're at. It sets up kind of the story today, but I wanna kind of tell you the very first thing that I think is important is that this, this thing we see in the story, while we can run away from our problems, eventually we're gonna have to return and face them. And that's generally true in any area of our lives. I mean, there are occasional times maybe you can run away from something and it doesn't creep back, but most things you run away from and you don't face head on, you're going to have to eventually face it. And that's what we see here. Jacob had run away from his brother, but now he has to return home. And he knows that returning home means he has to face his brother. And he knows what he left. Listen, 20 years has passed, though, between this time. Okay, and in those 20 years, Jacob's not the same person he was when he left. And he, yet here he is coming back, and he's afraid. He knows when he left, his life was on the line. And he also knows that he can't run away this time. He can't go back to Laban. That, that door is closed. There's a boundary he can't cross anymore. So he now must face his brother head on. So he starts doing what he always does. He starts concocting a plan. And so he sends messengers to his brother and he says, hey, listen, I'm coming. Let me have your favor as I come in. And so when the messengers return to Jacob, they come back with the news, your brother's coming out to meet you. And so is 400 other men. <laughs> so I want you to think about what that is. And look what it says in verse 7. Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. Why? Because the last time his brother saw him, he was, he was breathing down his neck going to kill him. And now he's bringing 400 men. And that doesn't look like peace, does it? It looks like he's going to come back and finish the job. And so once again, he goes back to concocting his own plan and he decides, I'm going to split my family and my possessions in half and I'm going to put one group here and one group here. And then if Esau comes and he attacks some of my family, maybe the other half can get away and they can be safe. And that was his plan. And then he had another plan and it was, I'm going to, I'm going to send a huge gift to my brother. And this was a huge gift. And it was in, he did it in such a way that it would come in waves, okay? Like there'll be some sheep, okay? And here's a, gift from, here's a gift from your brother Jacob. And then there'd be some other animals. And here's another gift that would come in another wave. Then there'd be some, some money and things and that would come in another wave. And, and he's trying basically to give him a bribe so that he wouldn't be angry with him anymore and buy him off. And so Jacob takes his family and all he owns, crosses the fort of Jabbok, and then goes off to a place all by himself. And this is a part of the story we're waiting for, the wrestling match. <laughs> and here's, here's what happens. Jacob is all alone. It's now night. And he's afraid. Because tomorrow literally might be the worst day of his life. Might be even worse than that. He might not be around after tomorrow. Like he might die. Many of us, we've experienced that mix, right? We know the weight of such times. It always happens. You're all alone, it's the middle of the night, and there's this fear that just kind of creeps into your life. You don't know what tomorrow will bring, but guess what? Your imagination is sure running wild, telling you all kinds of things that are going to happen, and none of it's good, <laughs> right? And that's what's really going on. And all of a sudden, Jacob just kind of senses I'm not alone anymore. Someone's here. Ever had that feeling? You're supposed to be alone and you just, mm, all of a sudden, they just feel like that. And then this guy jumps on him. <laughs> so you find yourself wrestling this person. It caught you by surprise because normally you would have run, right? You would have been fleeing because you're not a fighter, but now you're in the fight. You're wrestling for your life. And the Bible describes it like this in Genesis 32, 24, 
Then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. Listen, later we find out he's wrestling with God. And so this is really what's, I think what's really important though to point out here is there's a little detail that's often missed that twists the whole nature of this story. And that is, is that Jacob didn't start the match. God did. The man came and wrestled with Jacob. I think that's really important detail because many times, what are we doing? We're running away from God, right? We're, we're cutting God out of the equation, trying to handle everything on our own. And eventually, what sometimes happens is God comes and picks a fight with us. Yeah. That's what he's doing here. And it's not a side of God that many of us focus on. But God is not passive. He's a fighter. And so he comes in, and look what he, it's, it's not the only place, look what he did to Jonah. I mean, Jonah's like not doing what he's supposed to do, so what does God do? God picks a fight with him and puts him in time out in the belly of a whale to think about where he's supposed to be. Like he, he puts him there. Think about King Nebuchadnezzar. I mean, this guy, God warned him, hey, you need to exalt me, and if you don't, I'm going to humble you. And the guy goes crazy out of his mind, is in the fields eating grass until he finally acknowledges God Almighty. And so God picks a fight often with us, and it is God that it puts Jacob in a headlock. And Jacob, he's just trying to figure things out on his own. And so God, he had to do something dramatic to get his attention. And listen, instead of Jacob spending the night really on all of his fears and trying to plot his way out of the mess he's in, God moves in and consumes his attention and energies until all he can do is just cling to God. This is w one reason why God wrestles with us, I think. Because, listen, he needs to get our attention off of everything else that's on. For some of us, it's like on our healing, right? I, I need to be healed, or I need this in my life. And we're so focused on that that God has to dramatically get our attention off of that and onto what really matters, Him. We need to get our attention on God. And often that takes something very dramatic that He has to do in our lives. But look at what it goes on to say in verse 25. It says, Now when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip, and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint, and he wrestled with him. I think it's interesting that it says when he did not prevail against Jacob. I mean, if this is God, how did he not prevail, <laughs> right? And, and I think the answer is, is, is really us as dads, we can get this, right? You get down on the floor and you wrestle with your kids, and they appear to be winning, but are they really winning? The, the real answer is, is you have not exerted your full force on them. You're allowing them to win. And that's often the way God deals with us. He treats us. He could cream us in a second. But that wasn't the point of him starting a wrestling match with us. The point of him starting a wrestling match with us was to find, it was a test to see, are we going to hold on or are we going to give up? When he sees Jacob won't give up, he touches his hip and puts it out of joint. And from our perspective, that just doesn't seem fair, right? Like, that's what you do? Like, it's really kind of funny because when you read in the original language and it says he touches his hip, it's just a little tap. Like you just a tap on your shoulder. And that put it out. And right then and there, he had to know he's dealing with God. Like this isn't like some new move you figure out and how to get out of a hold in wrestling by taking somebody's hip out of joint. No, this was God. And he just tapped him, and, and suddenly he, he feels that. Listen, it's important to understand that God doesn't play by our rules. And that's why sometimes life just doesn't seem fair. When we say life doesn't seem fair, you know what we're saying? It's not fair by my rules. <laughs> that's what we're saying, because in my book, this isn't fair, right? But, but the reality of it is, is God isn't playing by our rules. We've all been there, though right? We've been hit hard and you cry out, God, this just isn't fair. But here's what's an important truth that every one of us needs to cling to in those moments. God is willing to do the things in your life that appear to be unfair, but result in accomplishing his greater purpose in your life. Like that's what he's really after. 
That's why Romans 8.28 is so important. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purposes. God is always working his goodwill and good purposes in your life. Even the bad things. He's using those things to turn it around. And so in verse 26, it says this. And he said, let me go for the day breaks. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. It is here that we see Jacob knows now that he's not just wrestling some guy. Because if he's just wrestling some guy, he's going to be like, hey, get out of here. And, and, and just sigh a sense of relief that the match is over. But all of a sudden he says, no, I'm wrestling God. I'm not letting go till you bless me. Like, God, I need your blessing. And so he realizes that he needs the blessing. The question is for us, when we realize that who we've been wrestling all this time ends up being God, do we hang on and wait for his blessing or do we let go? Because many of us have been letting go. And because we let go, what we've been doing is missing the blessing that God has for us. Well, listen, this blessing is probably bigger than most of us would look, realize on the surface. Because I want you to think about Jacob's life again. When he got the blessing of his earthly father, he had to do it through deception. And this time, to get the blessing of his heavenly father, he doesn't have any deception. He's, God knows him inside and out, and yet God is blessing him. And I think there's something really big here because we need to understand that we can't use deception or manipulation or try to be somebody that we're not to get God to bless us. God knows us inside and out, and yet he has blessings for us. He's fully aware of who we are. And so in verse 27, he said to him, what is your name? He said, Jacob. Well, listen, again, when the man asked Jacob his name, he, it's not because he didn't know. It's kind of like the garden scene when God comes and says, Adam and Eve, where are you? It's not like he didn't know where they were. That question was to prompt them to come face to face with understanding the truth about themselves. And when he wants Jacob to respond with his name, he wants him to admit who he is. He's a grabber. He's a cheater. He's a deceiver. That's what my name is. He spent his whole entire life earning that name. That's who he is. And many of us, we've earned our name too. The challenge is in our culture that we live in, we have learned and have the tendency to blame everyone else for the name that we have earned ourselves. But one of the hardest things we have to do in life is to look truthfully at who we really are and own it and confess it. But it's when we own and confess who we really are that we have a chance to open ourselves up to Jesus changing us. Understand that the purpose of God breaking us is not to hurt us. It never is. It's always to bring us healing and wholeness. So... But the breaking is important. It's when we're broken that finally we're in a spot to really listen and obey God and what he has for our lives. And, and this is why brokenness is so important because brokenness actually sets us up to finally be the person God has called us to be, to be used by him in his way. If, if Jacob didn't have this time of breaking, he would never be in the position he was to be the father of the nation of Israel. So this breaking was important. It was only after though Jacob acknowledged who he was that God moves in and brings about a change he never saw coming. Look what it says in verse 28. And he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. God gives him a new name. He gives him the name Israel. And the name change always really happens with God. He tends to change our name because it changes the destiny we're going into. It changes our purpose in, in life. It redefines us. And it's what God does to each of us at salvation. It's why that last series that we went through about who I am in Christ was so important because it was taking hold of the identity of who we now are because of what God has done and, and beginning to live from that perspective. God has redefined us. That's why 2 Corinthians 5.17 is so important that if anyone is in Christ, you're a new creation. The old is gone. Behold, all things are now new. 
When God changes his name, though, to Israel, there's kind of a wordplay going on here that's interesting because there's two ways of translating the word Israel. The very first is the one who prevails with God. And yet at the same time, it actually means the opposite. It means God who prevails with man. And so in other words, it means that Jacob struggled with God in one, but it also means that God struggled with Jacob in one. Both were true of going on at the same time. And so when you say who won the match, well, the answer is God. Who lost, the answer was really Jacob. But who really won, the answer is Jacob. <laughs> Follow me yet? <laughs> That's kind of the paradox of life. Listen, when we wrestle with God, we always lose. But when we lose, we always win. Jesus, he really teaches this all throughout the time he was here on this earth. Let me give you three. Mark 8, 35. Whoever wants to save his life will lose it. Right? You have to lose to win. Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Matthew 20, 26. You have to serve to be great. Johnny might remember this. Remember the old van at church, Risen Savior, the first shall be last van. <laughs> you go in, the door would fall off that van all the time, so you couldn't open up the side door, so you had to go through the front. The first person in has to be the last person out. So we called it the first shall be last van. In God's economy, the values of the world are always completely reversed. The way up is down, the way to save your life is to lose it. When we wrestle with God, our defeat leads to victory. And so Israel has a double meaning. God is continually bringing you and I to a place where we surrender our will. And when we surrender our will, we obtain the only victory that really matters. In losing, we win. And so as we close today, I want... There's, there's so many things that maybe I could have pointed out and, and brought out into the story, but I want to really emphasize two more insights. The first is this. What did Jacob do to earn the blessing of God? The answer is that he really just chose to, clung to cling to God and not let him go. That's it. And here's what I know to be true. Every time we cling to God and we don't let go, there's blessing on the other side. And the reason is, is because God longs to bless us. You know, he never leaves us the way he finds us. You cling to God through your addiction, and the blessing on the other side is you're free. You cling to God through your broken marriage, and the blessing on the other side is healing and restoration. Listen, maybe for your marriage, the healing and restoration is, is for your marriage, and maybe for some of you that healing and restoration is for your life, but you're clinging to God through that. And there is healing and restoration in that. You cling to God through your financial mess and the blessing on the other side is peace and freedom. Listen, I'm not saying that any of that clinging is easy. I want you again to put this in perspective of the story. Jacob was wrestling through the night. I mean, there was... The fight was real. It was exhausting. It was hard. But he clung to God till the end and received his blessing. I think there's something important within that to not miss here as well. Jacob wasn't wrestling his demons. He wrestled with God. It was in wrestling with God that he finally came to the point of surrender and just clung to God because that's the answer. Listen, you're never going to find victory wrestling your demons. You're just not. It's never going to, you're never going to find the victory on the other side of that. Your victory is in Christ and Christ alone. And it's when we are wrestling with God that we finally realize that he's all we need and we just surrender to him that the ver there is victory. But that also sets us up for the second truth. We come out on the other side of the wrestling ma match walking differently than we went in. I think this is why many of us want to avoid and run away and tap out as soon as possible because we don't really want to walk differently. Genesis 32, 31 says, Just as he crossed over Penuel, the sun rose on him and he limped on his hip. Jacob comes out on the other side both blessed and broken. 
From that day on, though, he lives with a limp, and it reminds him of this encounter and the blessing he had from God. I think it's interesting. When you look at the story of Jacob, you never hear him complain about his limp. He walks through the rest of his life. In fact, if anything, you see, you see hints that he celebrated his limp because it pointed to his new story and new testimony of what God has done in his life. It's, it's recorded that they actually made a law that you can't eat a certain a certain part of the tendon because this was what was touched when he, that caused him to limp that way. And there was a, actually a celebration almost of his new testimony and new story. And here's a point of contemplation that I think we need to have. Do you walk differently because you haven't encountered the blessing of God in your life? I mean, let me put it this way. Can other people actually see that you're walking different and go, hey, why do you walk differently? Like I noticed that you're not walking the way everyone else walks. You're, you're walking quite differently than the way everyone else walks. Can anybody even see that? Because I want to say this. If that is missing and people can't see that we're walking differently, then maybe the answer is this. We haven't gotten alone with God and wrestled with him until... He has blessed us. Because you only come out on the other side with his blessing walking differently when you have a true encounter with God. And so the challenge is, is will we get alone and be in a spot where when God shows up and just wrestles us, we just are like, I'm holding on until you bless me and I'm not letting go. Even though we know on the other side is a limp. But listen, God always uses that to bring him honor and glory and it becomes your testimony. It becomes the very thing that you use to point others to Jesus and his goodness and the blessing he has for your life and for their life. Would you bow your heads? Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you for your word and I thank you for the truths that you have taught us today through Jacob and his wrestling match with you, God. God, I thank you that even though we may run away from you and go in our own direction, God, many times you come and you pick a fight with us, not to, not to obliterate us in any way, but God, to finally get us to cling to you and realize you're all that we need and we need your blessing. Jesus, I pray that this week we would have encounters with you where we just know, God, I, I gotta cling. I can't tap out. I need to cling to you. And Lord, may it change us, God. May it transform our lives. Thank you that you never want to leave us the way you find us. And I just pray that, God, you would meet us where we're at today and strengthen us and encourage us. Thank you for the blessings you have for us, God. May we also just see just how amazing your love is for us as our Heavenly Father today, God. And so we give you praise. We give you glory for this, Jesus.